Hello, friends. I'm Kathy Fay, Executive Director of the Boston Early Music Festival, or BEMF, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this first official event of our 2021-2022 concert season. I'm particularly honored to be joined by our esteemed artistic co-directors, Paul Odette and Stephen Stubbs, for this very special pre-concert talk prior to the opening performance of our Boston Early Music Festival Vocal and Chamber Ensembles, a program entitled, Here I Am, Ready for Kisses. Thank you, Paul and Steve. Pleasure. Before we begin, as a reminder to those in attendance, the opening concert of our 21-22 Benf Concert Series themed Together Again on Saturday, October 16th at 7.30 p.m., Jordan Hall, New England Conservatory of Music, will be offered virtually as well. Needless to say, after 20 months of seclusion and isolation, we are confident that the steps we have taken to assure a safe and responsible re-entry to in-person concerts and concert-going life should offer our fans the confidence and comfort you deserve. That said, Online videos have been a source of music making and sharing at a time when it was most needed. For those who cannot or are not ready to attend our concerts in person this season, we invite you to engage virtually. You can enjoy the video recording of this performance beginning on Saturday, October 30th, through and including Saturday, November 13th, 2021. That is two weeks after the in-person performance. Tickets for our live in-person performances, as well as our virtual performances, can be purchased via the BEMF website anytime at BEMF.org. Paul and Steve, preparing for and rehearsing this concert in Boston marks an historic and important occasion as it will represent one of the few times in nearly 20 months that a selection of BEMF artists gather together to make music together in person. Uh, as our audience will see, we have gone to great and responsible lengths to assure the safety of our entire BEM company from wearing masks during rehearsals and performances to maintaining required distances from one another, providing proof of vaccination and more. Adhering to the challenges of COVID times for you required designing a program using just a few singers at a time. So this program, Monteverdi's late vocal works, is entirely appropriate from that standpoint. But within the field of Monteverdi, I notice that his last two books of madrigals, books seven, books seven and eight, keep reappearing on programs. And it's true of this program too. What is so special about them? Well, you could say that uh, it's the sort of culmination of Monteverdi's reinvention of the madrigal. Um, that is to say, when he began writing madrigals, uh, they were five part, six part affairs uh, of polyphony. And he lived through the time when that changed over to being something that was based on the basso continuo, the, the group that plays the, the chords. And that meant that madrigals could now be any number of voices you wish over that um, over that bass. And what he emphasized particularly in book seven was the vocal duet of two equal, equal voices, two sopranos or two tenors. And that was his main vehicle for this new kind of um, new kind of madrigal. In book eight, uh, which came much later uh, than book seven, it was sort of a last will and testament. It was sort of a, a, a place to put all of the great things that he had invented over his lifetime of music. Uh, so both of them are just splendid collections for our purposes. Yes, and many of the, the pieces that he published in the 1638 book eight were composed 30 years earlier, but he hadn't had an occasion to actually um, publish them uh, until, until that point. With my presenter and producer hat on, um, the music of Claudio Monteverdi, one of the most important composers of the turn of the 17th century, is still today a box office hit. Over 400 years later, you have both returned to Monteverdi again and again over your extended careers in this field. What is the special 
power or attraction of Monteverdi's music to you? Well, there's lots of things you could say about that. <clears throat> but the way, the way I look at it is that Monteverdi would have been a great composer whenever and wherever he had been born. But the fact that he was born uh, in Italy at this particular juncture, the sort of passing from the Renaissance to the Baroque period in music, and if you think of the, the year 1600 as a particular watershed, a, a sort of changing of the guards of all sorts of uh, elements of music, Monteverdi was right there in a North, Northern Italian court, which was where all the action was, um, to sort of preside over that. And there were many, many composers and, and poets and, and thinkers about music who were involved in this. But Monteverdi was the supreme master because he had the... Um, he had all the skills of a traditional polyphonic madrigalist, but he was right there with the newest ideas at the same time. So he could really do everything and he did everything. I think also beyond the, the genius of his, uh, of his musical mind, his ability to write in virtually every style. There's hardly another composer in this period who wrote absolutely everything from lighthearted uh, canzonettas to solo um, laments to uh, the 1610 Vespers, to masses, to operas, to, uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, duets for two equal voices, but then we also have three and four and five and six and up to eight voices in, um, uh, in, in the eighth book. And his ability to write in all of these different styles gives his music a kind of kaleidoscopic quality, that there's always something new, there's always uh, something surprising uh, happening the next moment. And there's, there's a comment um, that I particularly like that Monteverdi made in the preface to the eighth book of Madrigals, which is that he said he, he realized that um, sharply contrasted characters or emotions were the key to moving the soul of, of the listener. And so he wanted to write in a style in which the affect, the, the character, the mood would change frequently from, from one moment uh, to the next. And there are many wonderful composers in this period, but I don't think anyone else used that amount of contrast and variety from one moment to the next. And the other thing I think is remarkable is that he loved being a bad boy. He loved breaking all of the rules of music theory if he thought the use of a certain dissonance would, would make the text more viscerally um, meaningful. Um, so he didn't care what the theorists thought of him. He just went where he thought the musical means of expressing human emotions would take him. Fascinating. We usually think of madrigals as being for an a cappella vocal ensemble. But in this program, many of the madrigals include instrumental parts, two violins and a continual group. How and why did this happen? Well, it's part of it's part of that change I was mentioning before where the basso continuo comes into play. Like you say, the, uh, the madrigal uh, earlier had been an unaccompanied uh, event, uh, but then through time they began to uh, bring in the idea that an, an ensemble of instruments could accompany by simply taking the bass line as a basis. But that was not the end of the process. The end of the process was when they realized that by um, turning the bass line into basically a chord chart, a sort of a series of harmonic events, they could rethink the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it could become now uh, essentially um, a chord pattern over which you could deploy a single voice or two voices or three or whatever. Uh, but also uh, at that same moment, uh, composers were beginning to write for the violin particularly as the sort of uh, the, the expressive instrument that could be something like the human voice. So as 
you know, uh, in the in the 17th century, the trio sonata became a big feature of music in instrumental music. So two violins over a basso continuo. And like we've been saying, two voices over a basso continuo. And Monteverdi right away saw the possibilities of simply combining those two things. So for instance, uh, one uh, charming piece that we've done quite a lot and we put in this program as well, is called Chiomedoro, the golden, golden tresses, is for two sopranos, but also two violins in alternation and then sometimes together. Uh, and it, it creates a, an enormous uh, variety with only a few voices and instruments. This practice of uh, performing madrigals with instruments, either doubling the vocal parts or replacing them, actually started back in the 1520s when the madrigal was, was uh, developed uh, for the first time. You had the performance options of either performing a four-part madrigal in in that period or eventually five part and six part with lutes doubling the lower vocal parts or replacing the lower vocal parts so that it turned it into a solo song where you could have soprano singing the upper voice of the four part madrigal and a lute playing the lower three parts or there are lots of accounts of keyboard instruments, joining lutes, viols, recorders, other instruments, again, either doubling or re uh, replacing uh, in the, vo the vocal parts in these ensembles. And I think that what happened with the fifth book of Madrigals of Monteverdi is that he just added an extra part for that. Um, because the process was quite laborious for a keyboard player or a lute player to play those lower parts in a madrigal because you had to actually go through and write each voice part separately. You had to take the bass line and write that out in tablature. Then you had to write the tenor part in tablature. Then you had to put the alto part in tablature. There are whole books devoted to this to this process, Vincenzo Galilei's Il Fronimo and Adrien Leroy's book on how to make these arrangements for uh, for for lutes of vocal pieces, and I I think the brilliance of the new basso continuo concept that you could imply all of the harmonies of the upper parts by by simply providing the bass part. And there could be, if needed, indications of sharp for major chords or flat for minor chords or numbers that we call figures that could indicate some of the, of the dissonances just became a much less labor intensive way of permitting various chordal instruments to join in the performance of these polyphonic madrigals. Well, Paul got pretty far into the weeds there. Um, <laughs> I would say that as the, at the same time as there's an evolution of what Paul's talking about, where instruments could have replaced voices from the beginning and so on, and um, there was this laborious practice of figuring out what the voices were and so on, the big sea change is when they began to think not uh, a derivation from that polyphonic, polyphonic picture, but thinking from the bottom up, thinking of it as a series of chordal events. At, at that moment, everything changed because at that moment, not only could you play from a figured bass, but a composer could compose over a figured bass that meant that he could think harmonically in the first place rather than polyphonically. It's a, it's a really big change. Saying on that, that basso continuo concept, it, it consists of single bass notes, often long rhythms, but Yet when you have performed this kind of music in the past, we know that the continuum group plays full harmonies, arpeggios, strummed chords, tremolo effects, et cetera. How do you know what to do when the composer didn't indicate any of this in the music? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, well, for one thing, it's, it's mainly experience. And uh, since Paul and I have managed to do this for a long, long time, we've had a chance to get some experience with all of this. Um, I mean, there are, there are some descriptions, there's some really colorful descriptions. There's a man named Agatsari, who in 1607 wrote a, wrote a treatise about the use of the basso continuo. And he talks about the, the delights of, of sort of um, 
lutes trilling in every register and, and harps that could play high and could play low and the beautiful sonority of the Lirone and, and so on. So we have this sort of evocative description of what all these instruments could do. But then, as you say, when you're actually doing it, what do you really do? That's a question of uh, individual experience, but also very much the, the group experience of, of working in teams of continuo players where you sort of have a trust of each other to do what your instrument does best and contribute as you can. Agatsari makes a, makes a funny remark. He says, there are some people who have a facile hand and therefore uh, play all the time, lots of divisions and so on and making a, a terrible soup of the whole thing. And he says, that's disgusting to the, to the learned listener. Uh, and it's absolutely true. You can have a disgusting soup of continuo. Uh, you've heard that. Uh, but we we have trusted colleagues who don't make a soup and know when when their instrument is particularly called for and when not. Yeah, I think there are two common extremes that you often encounter in performance of this music today. Either the simply politely playing the right chord at the right time, often in a kind of generic uh, arpeggiated chord of of a certain speed and then staying out of the way to not participate in the music making. That's one very common approach that, that we often hear. And the other is exactly the thing that Agatsari says not to do. Uh, we hear frequently today performances with hyperactive lute players playing running passages, ornamentation all over the place. This is exactly what the treatises say. Don't do that because it disturbs the content of what you're trying to accompany. So our approach has always been our job is to, as Steve likes to say, co-dramatize the music with the singers. If the singer makes a crescendo, our job playing a chordal instrument is to arpeggiate a chord in a way that creates a crescendo with them. Because if we go plink and they make a long developing crescendo, you're working at cross purposes. Um, and, and so we're trying to imitate all of the shaping and effects that the singers are creating so that we are all moving as one organism, the instruments and the voices towards the same goal of shaping all the notes in the same way. Absolutely fascinating. And your masters at that, I might, I might admit. Along similar lines, Monteverdi did not write, as far as I understand, any performance instructions in his scores to include tempo, dynamics, articulation, et cetera. Without any specific information from the composer, how do you decide what to do? And how do we know that your decisions correspond to what Monteverdi might have had in mind? Well, you're, you're right to say that he didn't give a much in the way of performance instruction. I mean, certainly by comparison to 19th and 20th century scores where uh, composers often get quite far into the domain that we would consider that of the performer. Um, Monteverdi just trusted his musicians to know what to do. And so we try to be like his musicians and, and intuit what he meant. But th there are a few things that he wrote down about performance practice and they're like precious jewels to us to just find, oh, he said something about how to perform something. There's a wonderful thing at the end of uh, Tancredi and Clorinda, the, you know, the big combat combatimento um, uh, in which Clorinda's last dying phrase, he says that the strings play morendo. They sort of play a long note that dies with her. It's a wonderful evocative image, but there's, there's more, um, particularly I find in the score of Orfeo, which is just unbelievably rich in uh, particulars about how to deploy the, con the continuo instruments, for instance. He tells you in this particular passage, it was played with uh, the organ and the chitarone. In this passage, there's the, uh, the bass de viol violon and, and the harpsichord and the lute. So you know that at certain moments, uh, he had a certain sonority in mind. And uh, we've done a lot of, you know, trying to read the tea leaves of what that means. And you, you can go quite far along those lines. You can, you can look at what Monteverdi left as, this is what should happen at this point. These are the instruments that should be playing and say, ah, this is a moment when it's supposed to be quiet. Like for instance, when 
Orfe uh, Orfeo uh, sings to Caronte to convince him to let him into the underworld, at a certain point, Caronte, instead of reacting, falls asleep. And at this point, uh, it's just an organ solo. You, so you realize that um, Orfeo is being quiet so he doesn't wake Caronte up so that he can actually get into the underworld. So that, that sort of tip from Monteverdi about why you would do a certain thing is what we try to uh, intuit and, and then use for other purposes. And also, of course, the, the, the mood, the character, the affect of any given moment or the overarching mood uh, of a piece gives information to us about the, the tempo, the dynamics, uh, and so on. One thing that was talked about a lot in, in 16th and early 17th century sources on rhetoric and public speaking is that as you become more agitated, as you become more excited, your voice goes up and you get louder. And as you become more relaxed or perhaps more resigned, your voice goes lower. And so they imitated that in the musical writing. So in general, you can see that when Monteverdi writes something in a very high tessitura, it's generally quite heroic and strong. And when it's in a a uh, middle tessitura, a middle register, it, 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 it is a more moderate character. And when it goes low, it can, it can very often be a resigned or gentle or even whispered kind of affect. Now, the thing that's interesting about music is that it's not paint by numbers, and there are many exceptions to these. Monteverdi loves having a soprano line that goes up higher and higher off to heaven. Uh, and on the word cello for heaven, it's the highest note, which obviously wants to waft into the high register with a diminuendo. And the bass may respond by saying in terra on, on earth or uh, abiso in, in the uh, hell. And that will be a quite low note, which wants to be strong and, and earthy. So there are many exceptions to the basic rules, but the basic rules are a starting point for a lot of this. It's, it's also sometimes led to misunderstandings. I mean, I, I think often of the first words that Popea says in the uh, In Coronazione di Popea, she says signor on very low notes for a soprano. And so uh, a lot of uh, people looked at that and said, oh, she must be a mezzo soprano because she's starting off on a low D. But no, this is pillow talk. And so she's just whispering in her lover's ear. It's not it's not about that. She's a mezzo soprano. <laughs> so you've talked a lot about uh, the role of continuo instruments in this music, um, but I'm especially wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the Lirone that unusual, beautiful instrument played by our veteran Banff Orchestra member, Aaron Headley. Well, Aaron is not only the veteran player of the Lirone uh, in our context, she's basically the person who reinvented the instrument in our time. I mean, people had known that there was such a thing. And I think even a few people had built something that was like a Lirone, but Aaron is the one who just carried it out as sort of a the passion of a lifetime to revitalize the Lirone as a, a practical instrument. It's, um, it's a bowed instrument. And so the people who play Lirone tend to come from the viola da gamba or maybe originally the cello. Um, but it's a very unusual uh, arrangement of strings. Very, very unusual. For one thing, it's got many, many strings. I, I don't know, 19 or something like that. Uh, but over, over a very flat bridge, um, such that the, the bow can, must actually uh, go across three or four uh, strings at a time and therefore play chords. And the, the, uh, the arrangement of strings, if you, if you actually pluck the, the strings in order of a Lirone, it's a kind of amazing thing because it's in a circle of fourths or circle of fifths, like pom pom pim pom 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 pom. This is it's really not a, not a logical thing but that allows for this chordal playing. So with quite uh, simple um, left-hand positions, you can achieve the basic major and minor chords. And one of, one of the things about it is that it, 
can go almost any place. It's a very sort of omni-harmonic instrument. Whereas uh, Paul and I have been talking about this a lot lately that uh, with lutes and guitars and theorbos, they tend to one side of the map or the other, like theorbos and guitars like to be in major key, in, in uh, sharp keys, uh, lutes like to be in flat keys. The Lerone is really kind of ambidextrous in that way and able to get around to every every key area and be in tune in all those different areas, which is kind of interesting. And it has no bass notes, which is is often uh, perplexing to people experiencing it for the first time because it looks like it's the size of a of a viola da gamba, and yet it's only playing in a tenor register and doesn't ever play the bass of the harmonies. It, it, it normally plays second inversion versions of these chords. And for that reason, you almost always have to have another instrument supplying the bass. Otherwise, uh, the harmonies are rather confusing if you're only hearing these inverted chords all the time. So you need a theorbo or a viola da gamba or a cello or some other instrument supplying the bass over top of which the lirone rides. It's incredible. Wow. Let's let's talk about the singers a bit. Um, on this program, we recognize many familiar names, Aaron Sheehan, Jason McStutes, Tess Wakeham, to name a few. Uh, we often refer to these singers as a Benf company of singers, in this case, the Benf Vocal Ensemble. And yet there is one singer on this program, uh, Cecilia Duarte, who is making her Benf concert debut with this program. How do you guys think of the evolution of the of the Benf Vocal Company, the Benf Vocal Ensemble? That's also a really interesting question for us. And one of the ways we try to encourage evolution, you could say, is with our young artist training program that we do at the festival every two years. Uh, that's, been, that's been a wonderful source of, of getting to know uh, young singers that can then play a part in the evolution of the, of the company. In the case of uh, Cecilia, we, we had not worked with her before, we had, uh, in fact, first asked uh, Reggie Mobley to be the alto on this occasion, uh, who we have worked with before. And he said, well, I'm not free for this, but you should really uh, get Cecilia because she's so wonderful. So we went to hear clips of her and indeed she is wonderful. So we're looking forward to having that new voice in our in our company. But the, the truth is that um, we, we like very much to have a, have a sort of stable feeling about the, the group of people that we work with because, you know, you build up relationships and you build up a sort of trust and you also know what each other can do. Um, and it's particularly, I think, maybe extremely meaningful for Gilbert Blain, our stage director, in the context of making a new stage production because he knows how far he can push an actor to, to do this or that on the stage and so on, knows what to expect from them. So um, I think we will always have a, essentially a stability in the company, but always, of course, looking for wonderful new talents. It's also when we're working with people we've worked with a lot in the past, it's, it's a lot easier and faster to put a, a project together because they already understand our house style, how we approach things. We understand their strengths and weaknesses and it, everything just goes a lot faster. If you have to start off with a whole new group of people, it, it's a very steep learning curve to get everybody on the same page, to get everybody on the same wavelength, to understand what we're trying to do with the with the music. But it's so important to always bring in new new blood and to combine the people who already know the way we work and know what we want with new people, so that there's always new blood, fresh ideas, and and so on. Wonderful. So. Just moving away from Monteverdi for a second, although his first position in Mantua was as an instrumentalist, Monteverdi didn't leave us with any instrumental music except for a few brief symphonias. On this program, you're performing some sonatas by his close colleague, Dario Castello. Can you introduce us to this mysterious figure and to his modern music? 
Is there a strategic or musical or historical reason to pair the madrigals of Monteverdi with instrumental music by Castello? I, I have some new hot off the press information about this. <laughs> For a long time, Castello was considered a rather shadowy figure. Um, all we had were his two books of music. Nobody had managed to find any documents about him. There were even suggestions, since we don't have any independent instrumental music of Monteverdi, and because Castello's style is so similar to Monteverdi's in many respects, his unusual uh, style of ornamentation that, that he uses, where things always go in a slightly new and unexpected way from uh, what what one might expect. People had even suggested that maybe Castello was a pseudonym for Monteverdi and that these were Monteverdi's unknown instrumental pieces. But in some brilliant new detective work, an Italian musicologist has just discovered that uh, Castello, in fact, was born in Venice in 1602, and he was hired by Monteverdi shortly after Monteverdi uh, took over a, at St. Mark's in uh, in Venice, at San Marco, and he was um, the main violinist in Monteverdi's band there, together with his father and his brother. Um, one of them, I think his father was also a violinist, his brother was a trombonist. Um, and so it's clear that he worked closely side by side with Monteverdi for for his his uh, whole career, which was unfortunately extremely brief because he died at 28 uh, of the plague in 1631. And we now have all of this information about Castello, which a couple of years ago was com uh, a complete mystery of this person as a figure. But certainly Castello's music is the closest to, to Monteverdi of all the instrumental music in this period. Uh, the pieces we're playing are from his second book, which is 1629, which is exactly equidistant between the Monteverdi seventh book of Madrigals uh, and, and the eighth book of, of Madrigals. So it's exactly in this time period. And as he worked with Monteverdi on a daily basis, one suspects or assumes that maybe even Monteverdi suggested a few ideas or may have even worked with him uh, on, on crafting these amazing pieces. Steve, having read your excellent program notes, which by the way will be available in our printed program and in our downloadable program on our website, why do you think Monteverdi believed the quote unquote, explicit aim was for music to express the entire range of human passions. I don't know why he thought that. I'm just grateful that he did. Uh, it's, it, you, you could say, uh, again, it has to do with his time and place um, because uh, all of the ideas that were fomenting there, particularly in Florence uh, about the, the way of recapturing the magic that the ancient Greeks seem to have had in their theater and music in which they were able to move people to strong emotions. And this was, this was sort of held up by thinkers of the time as a great contrast to what music did in their time, which was just to be something pretty and decorative and make you feel good and, and uh, give you a nice, uh, a nice time. They didn't want just that. They wanted something more. And Monteverdi became really the, the particular messenger of that more, that uh, actually reaching out and making you feel certain things. Uh, and opera, of course, is the, the ultimate vehicle of that. And, and Monteverdi, you could say, guided the whole musical world from the earliest court operas. You could think of his Orfeo and... Um, Ariana, which happened uh, early in Mantua in the first decade of the 17th century. And then he becomes this sort of mature musician, head of the, the, the Maestro di Capella of San Marco and, and so on. Um, and along the way in 1625 uh, makes this rather remarkable piece, the Combattimento with uh, 
basically changing changing the idea of how far you could go in making music tell a story on a sort of moment by moment basis. He takes this whole battle uh, at nighttime of, of Tancred and Clorinda and, and says, this music is there to portray the battle in every one of its moments. So that has to happen on the scene as well. And then you get to the end of his life uh, where he's uh, being brought into the public opera in Venice and writes his last three operas. We only have two of them. We have Ulysses and Popea. That's the short of the Ritorno di Ulisse and the Incoronazione di Popea, but we always just call them Ulysses and, and Popea. Uh, and there you have the, the final culmination of everything he thought about this idea of moving the emotions. And I would, uh, I would argue that book eight and the two last operas that we have is, is the, the full statement, the full final musical will and testament of Monteverdi's lifelong uh, attempt to move the emotions. I think there was already a desire to try to express the human emotions in the most vivid way possible in, in the 16th century. There are various people who talk about this. Um, one that, that is particularly meaningful to me is uh, Galileo, the astronomer's father, Vincenzo Galileo, who was a lute player and musical theorist. And he talks about the fact that the reason he believed the lute was the, the instrument best placed to mimic the passions of the human soul was that it had the dynamic and timbral variety which players of the organ and harpsichord were unable to to make and he specifically says the ability to express durezza e mollezza so hardness and softness asprezza e dolcezza asprezza is harshness dolcezza sweetness which we hear lute players doing on a on a daily basis i just think monteverdi was able to do all of this more effectively than anyone up until that time. And and most people who came after Monteverdi, I would add. And I don't know if you have the same experience, Paul, but what I feel, I mean, this this thing that you're expressing about the um, the, the lute's range of, of uh, dynamics and, and timbre and so on, uh, what I feel when I'm playing in an ensemble doing Monteverdi, for instance, with voices and instruments and so on, I'm doing what I can to contribute to that sort of overall uh, emotional uh, message and also the dynamic changes and the timbral changes and so on. But that that thing that I'm doing on my instrument is sort of fulfilled in a bigger picture way. So you feel like you're doing it and suddenly it's there in, you know, kind of uh, multicolored uh, realization by all the voices and instruments doing doing the same thing. Well, it's about all of the musicians trying to do exactly that thing at the same time, uh, combined with the power of Monteverdi's genius in the musical writing. So, guys, just one or two more questions. You determined the title for this program, Here I Am Ready for Kisses. Um, does this have a larger meaning beyond being one of the titles of Monteverdi's pieces? Just seemed like a good good thing uh, now as we're getting to actually see people in person again. Right. That uh, you know we're ready we're ready for human contact. Yeah, <laughs> no question about that. So and it, it's the, it's the one really humorous piece um, uh, on the on the program. It's a it's it's a, a, about a woman saying, "Well, you, you can kiss me, but don't leave marks." Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's really a, a fantastic uh, piece of, of musical humor, uh, and I think we need that these days. Oh, yeah, for sure. So before I let you go, um, Monteverdi is justly famous as a composer of Baroque music, but you guys have consistently pushed the envelope by prominently programming many composers on the Benf concert and opera stage that many of us have not heard of Agostino Stefani, Andrei Campra, Luigi Rossi, just to name a few. Do you have any special surprises in store for us for the next few years that you can Quite share? Quite a few, actually. Paul, you want to start on that? 
Sure. Well, it's not only a question of, of presenting unknown composers. We have that coming up at the uh, 2023 festival with the, um, our staged production of Henri Desmarais' opera Circe. Desmarais was a very important figure in France in the late 17th century, one of the most acclaimed opera uh, composers, and this is a work written on a libretto by uh, uh, the first female librettist in in France, Madame de Saint-Ange. Um, and um, we have a program coming up next year of music by the great Roman composer Marco Marazzoli, who is a great composer who's been unjustly neglected. Uh, and this is a program of some of his amazing cantatas for four, five, and six voices with instruments, sort of happening uh, uh, around the same time as the Monteverdi Eighth Book of, of Madrigals, even though Marazzoli was working in Rome. But in addition to music by less well-known composers, we like doing works by well-known composers that are less known works of those composers. So we have in the chamber opera coming up in, in November, uh, Telemann's Intermezzo Pimpinone. That's a well-known piece that has been performed quite a bit, but coupled with his very late uh, cantata Eno, which is certainly one of the greatest pieces that Telemann ever ever wrote. He was 84 when he, when he wrote it. And as great a piece as it is, it hasn't been performed that that frequently. So I think our mission is to present not only unknown composers, but great unknown works by well-known composers. Very good point. Absolutely. The, I, I just add to that that in the in the festival coming up, the 23 festival, not only will we have the debut of Desmarais Circe, but we'll have a reprising of the Alcina by Francesca Caccini. Uh, the first opera of all written by a woman, uh, and it's it's a fantastic work. And Francesca is a is a really notable personality, as is Barbara Strozzi in the in the seventeenth century. And then after all of that, uh, what would have been the centerpiece of the twenty three festival, will God willing, and we're all still there, and the river don't rise. Uh, in twenty five, we'll we'll have uh, a, an opera by Reinhard Kaiser uh, as as the centerpiece. And this is a particularly meaningful thing to us because uh, Paul and I have been investigating the Hamburg opera and the composers attached to that. Uh, Handel's Almira was one of those pieces. The uh, Matazon Boris Gudenov was another. We, we've really spent a lot of time at the Hamburg opera and yet the most uh, important composer at the Hamburg opera for that whole period was Reinhard Kaiser and we haven't done one of his yet. So we finally get to him. Thrilling, absolutely fantastic. Paul and Steve, thank you so much for this most illuminating talk. Um, and thanks to our audience as well for joining us. This last year and a half have brought unprecedented challenges and all of us at Banff are profoundly grateful for the support and encouragement of you and all of our fans around the world. So on behalf of the board and the staff and all of the Banff artists, my sincere thanks. Um, just a final reminder that tickets to this opening performance of the 21-22 concert season featuring the Banff Vocal and Chamber Ensembles, directed by Paul Dodette and Stephen Stubbs, on Saturday, October 16th at 7.30 of the earlier time, in Jordan Hall at New England Conservatory of Music, both actual and in-person and virtual tickets are available at our website now. That's benf.org. See you very soon. Thanks again, guys. Thank you. Thank you.